Hello, my friends, Takuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the History of Everything podcast. My friends, welcome back. And today we have a very special, very fun topic. Something that honestly, I don't think gets enough attention when talking about things in history. Something that is very close to my heart. Indeed. Now, before it is that we get into today's show, which is going to be about the Barbary Pirates, which is always a fun thing, because again, I mean, Gab, you're from the Caribbean. Everyone thinks of Pirates of the Caribbean. I know. Like that's, that's what I was thinking. I was like, okay, so there are other pirates. Crazy. Because oh we know God. like in Somalia, there were like, you remember the whole piracy thing with Somalia? Yes. The, it's it, still oh, ongoing. It's still ongoing. In fact, guess what? That came back. That stopped for a whole period of time. And now it came back. But it's weird. There was this very, um, there's this period between like, God, what was it? 20, like basically 2012 and 2022, I think it was, where huge amounts of piracy were not occurring out of Somalia, which had been almost completely destroyed from it. Like the piracy was almost wiped out to then occurring in off the coast of Guinea, if I re recall correctly, like it's West Africa. Like that is where you are getting more piracy in that region. So explain Barbary Coast. Where is that? OK, so when we talk about the Barbary Coast, this is referring to North Africa. This is the region in here going from Algeria, Morocco, essentially all along the coast below Europe. It is it is northern Africa with its shores being in the Mediterranean. OK, and that's what we're referring to here today. Because my friends, for as long as there have been ships, there have been pirates. And honestly, when we say this, the Mediterranean Sea is really no exception to that. Like, yes, we're going to be going in and talking about the Barbary pirates. But if we are going into the history of piracy as a whole and how that kind of factors in, the first records of pirates in history are about Egyptian pirates, like dating back all the way to the reign of oh God, how am I even going to pronounce it? It's Akhenaten, I believe is how you'd pronounce his name. But that's back in 1350 B.C., which is a while ago. Now, these pirates would raid Egyptian shipping in the Mediterranean and in general be a massive nuisance. This is also around the time when talking about the Bronze Age collapse, that piracy becomes a really big problem during that period. And despite the rise of many empires in the Mediterranean, the problem is not ever really something that goes away. I mean, think about this. It's the Mediterranean Sea. This is the point in which all of the trade, all of the ancient empires, all of these different groups are going across this and they have to trade with one another. And you know who really likes it when people are trading and sending very expensive goods overseas? Pirates. Pirates. Exactly. And so that problem is just not going to go away. If you remember Caesar, we've talked about that story before. He was famously captured by pirates and hung around with them on their ships before coming back and getting his revenge and having them crucified. Is that when he got kidnapped and then he said, hey. He got offended by how little of a ransom they were asking for him. Yes. So he made them keep driving it up. And then when he got free, even though they were like buds at that point, he killed them all. Yes, because he promised them that he would come back to kill them all. Ooh. And they took it as a joke. Yeah, I would have thought the same thing, too. Like at that point, he got them more money. They were hanging out for weeks. I would have been like, what are we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, the answer was um, not in the, not friendly. That's that's to say the least, because, uh, yeah, he ends up coming back with a whole bunch of ships and then getting his revenge on them, which is brutal. And this honestly, this was very common in the Mediterranean for as long as there were empires like the warm waters of the sea and the abundance of goods flowing through it were a massive lure for any would be pirates, raiders, adventurers, or really anyone that could be affiliated with one of these other rival empires. I mean, some nations even employed pirates as a form of irregular navy, specifically targeting the shipping of their enemies in order to disrupt their economy and just in general be a nuisance. Like, think of it like this. This is one of my favorite little details in history going back into it, because when we were in Genoa in Italy, we saw this. Remember at the Maritime Museum in Genoa where they're like, yeah, um, so they literally didn't have like most of these kings didn't actually have a navy. <laughs> so then they would get. Uh, ships from all of the merchants who weren't using their ships at that time, right? Yes, who would loan them out for ludicrous sums of money. Interesting. Why didn't the kings have a navy? They just didn't have the money to invest in it or? Oh, terrible investment. Like they, here's the thing. Unless you are planning a specific invasion, you don't need a navy like 90% of the time. 
You really don't. Until the day of wide spanning trade empires, there is literally no reason to keep around a very sizable navy. You just need some vessels that are used specifically for trade, for some military purposes, patrols, etc. You literally don't need one. And so this becomes a very big problem in some cases because you can't adequately respond to a force. Hell, hell, this goes back to the whole thing with Rome. When Rome came up against Carthage, they didn't have a navy. So what do they do? They're like, damn, we're going against a force that has a navy and we have to get across the water to attack them. What are we going to do, guys? Let's build a navy. And they literally build it from scratch and it gets destroyed. Oh, that's a whole other thing, which if you all go back and listen to the episodes we did on the Punic Wars like that, <laughs> oh, that is a thing. So pirates were very commonly employed as a kind of irregular navy in order to attack enemies. This was a thing. And that background is very important because the very set notion of raiding your enemy is what would really kickstart the Barbary pirates. Okay, so the kings would employ pirates even though the pirates would be stealing from them? Yes. That seems like a really dangerous, risky move. Oh, it is. It's, it's literally a classic explanation of, oh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> oh my God. Except in this case, it's like two guys picking a fight in a schoolyard. And so they go over to some like bully who hates all of them and being like, hey, go attack him. He attacks him, gets turned on. Do you have any idea how many times in history that happens of like a mercenary force getting paid to attack someone who in turn then turn on their benefactors? The Huns did that repeatedly against the Byzantine Empire because they were used as mercenaries by the Byzantines who then turned around and extorted money from and raided the Byzantines. Wow. Who would have seen that coming? A Not lot of people me. actually, but it was a really easy job. Why raise an army when you could just pay someone to fight for you? Valid. So that's how that works. Anyway, the support that was given by the Ottoman Empire was extremely important for spreading, well, piracy and the menace of it. With support from their eastern neighbors, the pirates were able to turn their attention on the west. And what we're talking about here are essentially three different pirate states, though calling them states is a very loose term in the Mediterranean. You have what is today Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And while they all had similar aims and common allies, they acted pretty much independently to each other. And they were technically speaking vassals of the Ottomans, but also kind of independent. It's a really weird relationship. Much like other raiders, though, their aims were almost entirely economic. Yes, religion is a factor, and we are going to mention this in here. Because remember how there's a number of taboos in, uh, in many religious cultures of like, not enslaving your fellow Christian or Muslim or anything like that. Some places have less taboos. Others find ways around it, which happens time and time again in history. But generally speaking, it's kind of taboo. Yeah, that was the case for the Muslim Barbary pirates. Well, if they're not supposed to be attacking Muslims and they're being backed by the Ottomans, who are the Ottomans constantly fighting? the Christians, who's right across the waters, and they can are, they're not, they can, they are within spitting distance, arguably, or harpooning distance of all the Christians. So as you can probably guess, that meant that there was a very easy target. With valuable backers getting a portion of whatever goods were taken, the pirates were interested in things that could fetch a high price back in the Mediterranean, notably ships and slaves. Once captured, slaves could be expected to be taken back to the home port and then sold, which would benefit the crew and their backers. Or if they weren't sold, like what would happen if they, for example, captured some kind of noble or a noble's family member or someone of somewhat kind of importance, then they would be able to ransom them, which was a hugely lucrative thing. Now, it's important to note here that while the raiders often went west, this is, of course, more due to the fact that their benefactors were the Ottomans more than anything else. With the support of the expanding Ottoman Empire, it was politically and economically significantly more beneficial to raid the Western European nations than to risk the anger of the Ottomans, who were both much closer and much more able to hurt them. Which they could do. But OK, here's the question then. If anyone knows geopolitics at all or 
historical geopolitics. Remember how Spain controlled that little tiny bit at the end of the peninsula, Gibraltar, which is currently controlled by the UK and has been for many years? Yes. Okay, so the point that connects, not connects, but the point that is uh, where Africa and Europe are closest between the northern part there of Morocco and then Gibraltar is very, 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 very narrow. And so you'd think, okay, the Straits of Gibraltar is something that should be able to easily be guarded. You should have some ships that are able to immediately go in there. Any pirate vessels get spotted and get blown up by cannons at a literal moment's notice. You would think that. But then you remember technology. Yeah, things back in the 17th century were not exactly advanced. Uh, limited artillery technology paired with the advantage of Barbary ships over their European counterparts at this point meant that pirates were pretty much able to head out into the Atlantic with pretty much impunity. They could do whatever they want. And so while there were forts that could prevent ships from getting in close, they weren't able to effectively reach across the entirety of the strait. And that would permit pirates to pass through relatively easily and then attack coasts all along Europe. So from Italy to France and even as far as Iceland, places were getting raided out the wazoo. Iceland. Iceland. In fact, one of the most famous major raids in history specifically happened in Iceland. So many people were kidnapped when that happened. I mean, it was insane. What were they kidnapped for? Slaves. Interesting. Yeah, no, here's the thing that a lot of people get really confused on when talking about this stuff. Over the course of the year, like 1500 to 1830, it is estimated that over a million Europeans were kidnapped into, into slavery. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those points in history that is oftentimes glossed over because people, when they talk about the slave trade, specifically like to focus on the African slave trade, which is important when talking about things within the context of North and South America and the colonial period. But the overarching thing for slavery is significantly larger than most people give it credit for. And even to this day, there is still a massive slave problem going on in Africa. Like that is right now, te though technically illegal, there is a massive slave market in Tunisia. Really? Yes. Today, like this very day, that is something that happens. It is not pretty. It, it, it really isn't. But yes, this is something that happened. And so countries like England, Ireland, the Netherlands, Spain, France, Italy, all of these different groups experienced these raids. For anyone who has seen the post that we've made on Instagram or anything like that, um, I know that at some points you would have seen pictures of fortresses and other stuff when we were literally just in Italy. Many of those forts that were established there in the like Genoa and the outer lying territories. Or Porto Venere. Porto Venere. Literally Barbary pirate forts. Not, not owned by the Barbary pirates. They were meant to defend against piracy. That's huh. why the, um, that's why oh, some of our, our guide there, she specifically said, oh yeah, it's called a Saracen tower. I don't know why though. That's why Saracen was one of the terms that they would have for Muslim warriors, for raiders, Saracens. That's what they were. So they would look out towers. They were lookout towers specifically meant to defend against it. So all along the coast, they had to have defenses so that they can land and come raiding? To be spotted. Oh, and that's a very, very good question. Okay, they're not going to do much to stop it. Yes, it's a defensive point that people could hide in and be able to shoot down from because it's literally defensive fortification. The bigger reason is to have, the bigger reason to have a lookout tower is that these ships were fast. I mean, they were ridiculously fast. One of the things that goes into the time is that when I talk about the difference in technology, they use, and I'm, I know I'm going to go into more detail about it, they used lateen sails, which are triangular sails on these light ships that are not weighed down with heavy cannon. They do have some cannon for firepower, but not much. The biggest strength that these ships have is their speed. So like the Vikings of old, these Muslim raiders were able to move into waters, attack and get out before any kind of big warship was able to respond because they could simply outrun them. Wow. It was that effective. So that raid of Iceland that I was talking about as an example, which comprised of ships from Algeria and Morocco in 1627, this is easily one of the most iconic points of the pirate threat in the 17th century. 
with the fast ships, these guys could appear at any point along the coast. They could take any goods they wanted, ships they wanted, and most importantly, slaves. And then they could return to sea as fast as they came in. And this made European powers constantly on edge, trying to figure out how they could respond. Which brings up the important question. You're saying, okay, well, they have all these defenses. Why would they not just go and attack them? They know where the Muslim pirates are. They know where they're based out of. They know what's going on here. Why not send down a military force and just attack them? Wouldn't it start like a larger war? That is a great point. Yes, technically speaking, there's two different things. So plausible deniability from a state that, oh, no, those pirates, we didn't order them to go there. So the invasion of a territory that is specifically under the protection of the Ottoman Empire would invite trouble that largely is not wanted because regional geopolitics is very complex. The second thing is, holy crap, is that expensive? And simultaneously, that puts their own forces at risk. Here's the thing. France, Spain, Britain, all of these had really big navies, or significant navies, we should say. The problem is, is that in order to build even a single ship, that is stupidly expensive. Large warships still to this day I mean, you've seen the cost of what it takes to build like an aircraft carrier or anything. And back in the day, with lesser technology, even if the ships were smaller, they were still really expensive and time consuming to make. As an example, one of these, the HMS Victory, which was launched in 1765 for Britain, that cost an estimated 63,000 British pounds to build at the time. But you may wonder, okay, 63,000 pounds, that doesn't sound so bad. But that was at the time, what is that in modern currency? We're talking about something that is just shy of $950 million. Meaning, we're talking about a billion dollar investment in one ship. Well, that's why you don't build like 60 aircraft carriers, right? How many do we have? Like, uh, We have 11 super aircraft carriers. Right. So you don't build a million of them. You just build some really good ones. It's true. It's true. But then also there's a very severe risk that comes with this. Like think about it this way. Okay. If you went and lost even a single one of those ships to pirates, it would not only be a massive loss in terms of money, but prestige as well. You didn't want to do that. Simultaneously, if you went and sent even a small squadron, like the British at this time had, I mean, I say at this time, it was varying large different time periods for what they had at any given point. But if you want to estimate that their Navy had about a hundred of these big warships, like major warships, if they sent even a small squadron of something like five to 10 ships, you're talking about five to 10% of their entire Navy billion dollar vessels that are going down there and those could potentially get taken out by a rival because who's to say that France isn't going to go hey wait a minute they're sending down a good percentage of their very key forces that they need if I just sent you know 20 ships after them and worked with the pirates to take out a thing for my rival <laughs> who's gonna stop me okay fair yeah and guess what that is actually a real possibility Remember when I talked about geopolitics being extremely um, complicated? Do you know who was a ardent defender of Catholicism and the Catholic faith and Christianity as a whole? France. Do you know who one of their key allies was for a long period of time that they used in order to counterbalance things in Europe and also screw others over? The freaking Ottomans. Oh, man. The Franco-Ottoman alliance is one of the most complicated and weird little friendships in history because it it was probably just based in fucking over everyone else literally literally that's what it was it was entirely meant to counterbalance the Habsburgs and you know the Austrian empire as a whole and also to screw the British <laughs> because of course that is why they would do that so sending out forces like that would mean that they would be away for literally months at least potentially years and who knows if it gets destroyed and as part of that Remember when I talked about the whole thing for their uh, Navy, they were very hard to chase down these pirates. Their preferred ship was something known as a Zebek, which this more specifically used, as I said, a Latin sail. So it was a Latin rigged Zebek. And we're going to need to break that down. So Latin refers to the shape of the sails. 
which this essentially means that the sail is triangular, with the long side running from the deck up to the height of the mast. So when you like think of a small sailboat with triangle sails, those are oftentimes lateen rigged. These sails are typically more effective at grabbing the wind, and it allows for the ship to move faster since they don't cause as much drag. The way that a bunch of these older style European ships were, when you've seen, um, God, how do I even phrase this? You know when as a kid, and you're drawing a boat, like if you, because you, you had the whole lesson on Columbus and everything, and I'm sure, did you all do things where you had to draw the ships? Yes. Yes, okay, I had to do the same thing. And did you draw the ships with like big, giant, square, billowy masts? No, I just looked at my textbook and I drew the ship from my textbook. Oh, okay. I digress. <laughs> but that's like the stereotypical representation that you think of a kid drawing a sailboat and it's like this big, square rigged thing. And that's largely what the Europeans had for their warships. So, yes, they were very powerful and armed with cannon, but they were slow. Hello, my friend, Sakuya here. And before we get back to the show, I would just like to thank today's sponsor, Rocket Money. For those of you who don't know what Rocket Money is, Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps you find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitor your spending, and help lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With over 5 million users, it has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. And this is something that personally, I have used extensively, as I said, for years. This is something that even with my knowledge of history, I can be a very forgetful person for basic things like signing up for something and then forgetting about it. I have done this more times than I can count, and even now my wife is looking at me from the side here like, you better not forget the latest one that you just did. Which I might, but guess what? Rocket money will save me when I do. So I'm saying this right now, stop wasting money on things that you don't use, cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash ho. That is rocketmoney.com slash H-O-E. Rocketmoney.com slash H-O-E. And so the Zebek, this was a type of ship that was very common in the Mediterranean at the time. They have a very distinctive look about them with an overhanging bow and stern and oftentimes at a pretty striking angle. Paired with Latine rigging and also the presence of swivel guns, the Barbary pirates could essentially dance around their opponents and pepper them while staying mostly out of their cannon's arc. And if the battle went the wrong way and they needed to get out of there, they could. The pirates would simply outpace their opponents and use the shallow drafts of their ships to essentially go anywhere along the coast that they wanted to. I want you to imagine essentially a swarm of wasps attacking you. There's a lot of them. They're small, there are more of them than there are of you, and from this, they are significantly more effective at what they are doing. (laughs) That is the problem that you run into. So, while there are some pretty sound military and technological reasons to not go after the pirates fully, there is one more reason that perhaps ties all of this together. Trade. You see, the European powers, specifically Britain, France, and Spain, all decided that they would just pay off the Barbary pirates to keep them from attacking their shipping. Literally just throwing money at the problem in order to make it go away. But what they soon realized in doing so was that, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. If we do this, we could corner the market on trade and force smaller nations to rely on us for shipping. All by increasing the amount that they paid and making it harder for smaller nations to be able to afford the same cost. Think about it like this. Britain goes in and offers the pirates, God, I don't know, um, 100,000 pounds. I'm I'm pulling a number out my butt, of course. Britain could afford to pay that. And now let's say that Iceland is given that same opportunity. They can't afford to pay it. They literally cannot afford to pay it. So what would they do? They would have to go through British trade networks, use British shipping, use their contacts, and they would have to utilize British services to do so, which increases their power and prestige. France did the same thing. Spain would do the same thing. Any power that actually had the ability to do something would do it, which would make all these smaller nations dependent upon them. That's honestly just smart financial decision it is it it is it's a smart geopolitical decision super shady but super shady yes absolutely 
And so, yeah, rather than losing their shipping, they simply decided to use the resources of the navies that could afford the higher price in order to make sure that their goods got to port safely. Genius. Absolutely genius. And over time, the smaller nations just simply couldn't keep up, and the larger ones had a monopoly on trade. And that problem would just never really go away, but it definitely would calm down as technology got better and the Europeans started to really pull ahead of most of the world at that time. Until... Until... The Americans entered the chat. Of course. See, here's the, here's the thing. Remember that whole thing about... um smaller nations being bullied into not being able to pay the ransoms and the fees and all those other things that the bigger European nations could afford? Yeah. Well, the American experience with the pirates is a little bit convoluted, so you're going to have to follow me along with this. We're going to be dealing with a few different groups, and it's important to know that these different bands were, well, different in the first place, while still simultaneously having similar aims and goals. They did still act independently, even if they shared common interests. So let's get into this. With independence gained in 1783 and entering global trade, it was really only a matter of time before American shipping would then have to deal with Barbary pirates, specifically about two years. After officially gaining independence, British diplomats were very quick to point out that, hey, um, American ships, these guys no longer had protection of the British Navy. So, hey, pirate buddies, wink, 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 you know how we paid you for protection of all of our subjects? The Americans are no longer our subjects. So, oh. yeah, they were pretty bitter after losing the American, like America in the Revolutionary War. Yeah. So in 1784, the Moroccan Barbary pirates under Sultan Sidi Mohammed captured a handful of American ships after the U.S. ignored their diplomatic overtures. Despite this very rough start, the U.S. and Moroccans were able to get into a relationship of more peaceful trade, which resulted in the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, signed in 1786. Wait, so they captured some American ships and then they became friends? Sort of, with the government. But remember, the pirates have a kind of pseudo-independent relationship with the government. It, okay, think of it like this. The closest comparison that I could give, which still not accurate from this sense, is that uh, remember the story with uh, Admiral Perry and showing up to Japan and with a giant gunboat and saying, hey, guys, uh, you're going to trade with me. No, we're not. Yeah, you are. Or else I'm going to shoot you. Oh, yeah. That's pretty much how the pirates were. It was, hey, open up diplomatic relations with us or this is going to become way more common. But I totally did not order this to happen. And they called it the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship? Yes. Who was in charge of naming it? Uh, actually, that's a great question. I am not sure, but this is, that's a very common thing that would actually happen. It's funny how many things were named grand names of peace and eternal stability and friendship, and then it would last like a year at most. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> that is literally something that would happen. The treaty would lay the groundwork for future peaceful trade and would give the U.S. some relief from the threat of pirates. Incidentally enough, though, Morocco was one of the first countries to actually recognize the independence of the United States, despite not having official relations until 1905. So yeah, weird thing. But in 1785, De Muhammad of Algiers would declare war on the United States and capture some ships. Still launching the struggles of the Articles of Confederation, the New Republic was unable to gather the funds to pay off the pirates, and they were also unable to gather enough ships to launch a punitive raid against them or get the money to build a really big navy. Remember that whole thing about one of the most expensive ships there costing about a billion frickin' dollars? Yeah. So, okay. Thomas Jefferson tries to make a coalition of smaller navies to go after the Algerian pirates, but he couldn't get it to work. Luckily, the Portuguese were in a war with the Algerians, and they prevented them from being able to leave the Straits of Gibraltar, which made the waters of the eastern Atlantic safe for American shipping. When the war between Algeria and Portugal had a brief pause, this meant that American ships in the Atlantic were suddenly once again in the crosshairs, and now this is going to have to take priority. And so faced with this resurgence of pirates in the Atlantic, the U.S. would send diplomats to try and get peace treaties signed with the Barbary pirates. These diplomats were able to get treaties signed with Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, 
And in addition to paying tribute, about 80 U.S. sailors were freed from Barbary prisons. With the formal signing of the Constitution, then, the naval situation in the United States was going to tr change drastically. Now, you had an entity that was able to tax its people. Now, you had an entity that was going to be able to raise a navy. And so, Congress would go and authorize the creation of six frigates. The most famous among them, the USS Constitution, or Old Ironsides as we know her, which is, to this day, I think it is actually the oldest, or it is at least one of the oldest active ships in the world. It's still going. Really? Yes, it is. Have they rebuilt it like a whole lot? I mean, of course they've had to replace it. It was wood. So yeah, they, they, they have had to replace a number of things with it, of course. But yes, it's still going. So just after the turn of the 19th century. Well, I think it's the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world today. Oh, so you looked at, okay, so what, what is the details on it that I'm missing? Well, all I see is that it's the oldest commissioned warship that is still afloat in the world today. Because during the War of 1812, it gained fame from its original name, Old Ironsides. But I don't know. So it remains both a training and ceremonial ship for the Navy, as well as an educational experience for visitors. Like you can go visit it. Yes, it's used as a like a, a living museum, I guess you could say, because yeah. it's, it's active. But it's not out there like, Shooting people. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, technically speaking, you know how there was that movie, which I still need to show you here, Battleship, where they bring out a bunch of World War II battleships to fight aliens? Yes. They needed the same thing, but with the USS Constitution. Literally, <laughs> no, no, literally call it liberation and USS Constitution to liberate humanity from the alien menace. Okay, well, you can pitch that to a movie studio. They're really into remakes. So. Michael Bay would love this. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying, just after the turn of the 19th century, the Pasha of Tripoli, Yusuf Karamanli, he declared war on the United States on the grounds of late payment of tribute. The U.S. quickly responded to this with a naval raid on Tripoli, which would free American prisoners and ended the tribute system in 1805. This raid is remembered in the Hymn of the Marine Corps as these are the shores of Tripoli that are mentioned. Like, if you've heard the, the thing here from, like, the Barbary Coast, like, the shores of Tripoli, that is specifically what they're talking about. So in 1812, Haji Ali, the New Day of Algiers, ended the treaty previously signed with the United States and declared war once again. The Algerians timed this declaration to coincide with the start of the War of 1812, meaning that Americans would be focused on their domestic front and less likely to respond quickly. Again, remember the whole thing with the British being very quick to go, hey guys, guys, they're no longer under our protection. <laughs> this is the whole thing. The Americans were all, or the Americans, the British were already raiding American shipping to impress their sailors and force them into the war to be able to fight Napoleon. That's like literally the thing that started a bunch of the stuff with the War of 1812 is the British going in, stealing our guys and saying, oh, no, these are British so sailors that uh, ran away. So we're going to force all of you to now join us and fight the French. That happened. Really? Yes, it did. They literally were kidnapping people to turn them to fight the French. <laughs> they did this. What? Yes, they did. They did. That is imagine, literally the big start of the War of 1812. Imagine the optics of that nowadays, though. Kidnapping people to fight in your war. Do you have any idea how many people tried to run away from stuff? So in France, as an example, um, they had conscription. So if you were of age, you would be conscripted into the military of the French Revolutionary Army. You were. And a number of people ran away. This was a common thing all over the place. And there were many situations in which British sailors did, like, here's the thing. Some of them actually were escaped British people who had left. Because when you're a sailor, go figure, you could just hop on another ship and get the hell out. They didn't have trackers to, like, tr to track people down, you know? You just, you hopped on a ship and you left. Wow. Think about what happened with your grandfather, or, or great-grandfather in India. Yeah, he just, he dipped out. He dipped out, and that was a bunch of them. Huh. So technically speaking, there was something. But also for every one British subject that they would capture, there was like 10 more that were just American that were taken. So, yeah. Of course, as I said, the Americans would be more focused on the diplomatic front and less able to respond quickly. But once the Treaty of 
Ghent ended the war in 1815, President James Madison would turn his attention on Algeria, and Congress would declare war on March 3rd, 1815, or about three months after the War of 1812 ended. Free from the threat of British naval incursions, an entire squadron of 10 ships were sent to deal with the upstart pirates. Capturing two Algerian ships and a couple hundred prisoners, the squadron under the command of Commodore Stephen Decatur were then able to force the politically unstable Algerians to the table and effectively end all tribute and ransom from them. After this diplomatic and naval victory, Decatur would go on to Tripoli and Tunis and secure a similar agreement from the other two states. This would effectively break the terror of the pirates. Now, raids on Europeans and punitive counterstrikes would still happen, but they were never able to effectively wield such power again. And that decline would continue until it was stamped out completely, or almost entirely completely, by one specific entity. Can you guess? The, the French? French? Yes. Remember those, the whole thing about the French occupation of Algeria and how very brutal it was? Yeah. So one of the reasons that the French wanted to Frank Francoize, Frank, Frank, French, French, I'm going to use the term Frenchify. They I was just thinking of that. The reason that they wanted to French fry Algeria is because specifically they were sick and tired of getting continuously raided by pirates. And so they're like, well, they're not going to raid us if they're French. Uh... And so, yeah, see, here's the thing that the French failed to understand at the time, and it's always the classic mistake. French people are ready to burn France down at any given moment. Yeah. That was the mistake. But also, I feel like the pirates would still do piracy. They would, except in the case of what they ended up doing is a bunch of the native Algerians that literally lived along the coast, they kicked them out. So they would essentially go, oh, you're in this coastal fishing settlement. Uh, yeah, you now have to move three, four, five miles inland. Why? Because you're not allowed to have boats and start killing people again and stealing, kidnapping and selling them into slavery. That, I mean, that's messed up, though, because they're fishermen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also one of those things that fishermen would. God, how do I even pray? You know, there's that whole thing of people like moonlighting as something. Yeah. For pirates, there is very few professional pirates. It's like in the case of Vikings. They weren't just Vikings. They would be craftsmen, traders, soldiers, all different kinds of people. They would moonlight as pirates. So it was and their side hustle. It was their side hustle of murder and pillage. I yes. just miss when we had creative side hustles. <laughs> now it's just like people doing weird things with stocks and MLMs. Yeah. Back in the day, we could just pirate. <laughs> Gabby. I know you're saying that as like this dumb joke, but you are not wrong. Here's the weird thing about the history of piracy. It was a very lucrative thing. This isn't even like this isn't anything that I have going into here. Do you know who some of the most famous pirates were of these Muslim pirates? And this is the thing. Not many people are aware of this. Who? A number of these and not a majority, but a number of them were Europeans that converted to Islam so that they could continue to be pirates. Because when, when, you know how there was the golden age of piracy in the Mediterranean, or not Mediterranean, in, you know, the, the Caribbean. That was the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so when these privateers were no longer being employed by the state to attack the other states, like when British privateers or Dutch privateers or Spanish privateers were no longer being employed by their respective states to attack the other ones, they're like, well, being a pirate is really lucrative. We make a ton of money. What are we going to do? Well, where can we be a pirate? Mediterranean? No, we can't do that. If we go over there, th th we're not at war with anyone. What do we do? What if we convert it to Islam? Aha. A, a, some of them, not many, but some of them specifically did this, converted to Islam and then just continued being pirates. And you know what that's called? It's called improvising, adapting and overcoming the yep. obstacle. Yep. Oh, God, there was one other detail in here that I wanted to talk about. You asked about like, the whole thing with MLM. Um, piracy was basically a joint stock company. Explain. You know, there was that whole thing with the British and the Dutch and how you could invest in the East India Company for the VOC or the uh, British EIC. Yeah. So the way that a stock company works, as I'm sure many people are aware, as you're aware, is you fund a venture. 
the venture does something, if it brings back profit, you get to divide the profits amongst yourself. So you put in 10 gold, maybe you get back 100 because it made a bunch of profit. Thing is, piracy worked the same way. <laughs> so these were, uh, these were fishermen and others that would moonlight as pirates. They don't have the money as fishermen to get a bunch of cannon and other stuff to attack people. A fisherman can't afford a cannon. They can't do that. So what do they do? They get investors to invest in them, give them just a little bit of startup money to get a light ship going, maybe a couple swivel guns. And hey, you give us this stuff now. We'll pay you back three times the amount afterwards. Wow. So there was a literal pirate stock market even back then, essentially. And this would continue on to um, this is the thing that happened with Somalia. That's like the whole thing where they talk about with Somalia and the piracy. Uh, yeah, this would happen. Oh, my God. There was a literal Somalian pirate stock exchange. I feel like at this point we should have covered every type of piracy, right? Like we did the Chinese pirates. We did the Caribbean pirates. We did the Barbary pirates. Tell me there weren't any more pirates. Um, there are. But when we're we've covered all of the major piracy groups, all of the major ones. In fact, we've even talked about Vikings before, so technically we've done that one. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if there is anything that I perhaps missed. For those of you who are watching this here on YouTube or anything like that, please let me know in the comment section below if there are other kind of big piracy groups that you would like for us to cover, because there are actually a bunch of different ones. There's all kinds of different groups that did crazy stuff for raiding. So if you are interested in any of that, please let us know in the comment section below. Thank you all here for watching and or listening, depending upon where you're getting this. And that, my friends, is the end of today's story. Bye. Goodbye, my friends.